Okay. Good day. Good day. Good day. All right. Today's book is uh, African Cosmology of the Bantu Congo, Principle of Life and Living, Principles of the li of Life and Living. Dr. KB Fukio, Kim Wadinde, PhD. This guy is awesome, man. He uh, His education includes um, degrees in cultural anthropology, a BA in that school administration, um, master's in education, library of science, master's in that, and a PhD in education and community development. Um, he's lectured in prisons or houses of correction, um, director of library services, in Boston, uh, Tufts University, Yale, um, around the world and back, right? And this book is great considering um, the last book I read, I think it was Temple in Man. And going from that into this has been um, a, an amazing transition. I'm a, sort of a, got a little melancholy, I guess, about me because uh, reading this book and knowing I'm not an expert makes me um, really, like he just humbles me. The man just humbles me with his understanding. So much great, great stuff in this book. Um, so I'm going to walk through it. Just, you know, I got a lot of underlines again. <laughs> uh, so it's worth it. So this is a good picture of him. And I'll go back to the book for now. Got one other picture I'll probably show um, that relates to the book. Okay. And yeah, man. So when I... Uh, started reading it. It was pretty difficult at first because he does a lot of translations from the language in Congo. So Bantu Congo, he's talking about the area of like Central West area, uh, Central West Africa in the Congo area. But he also um, is speaking about um, the tribes there, like the tribe he grew up in was like over a thousand a thousand people and so he was initiated into all these secret societies um whew, and we call them secret but even that terminology can be a little misleading because it, it's just simply you got to be initiated it's not like it was they were trying to keep it from you it's just no you got to be initiated into learning um so a lot of differences that's one simple one compared to the way we interpret things in the western culture right okay let's just go for it uh, this is the introduction. How can someone be a true Africanist if he, she is not able to speak a single African language? How could he, she represent a system he, she dares not truly taste and feel? They impose themselves upon others by interpreting negatively other people's ideas, i.e. what they call their raw materials, their original work. Um, all kinds of cultural misrepresentation and fantasies occur in the process of filling in the blanks. Um, let me just finish this a work a teaching a gift a laugh or an explanation from a violent and bloody mind has a great impact on its consumer we are what we consume learn hear see and feel okay skimming down this last part of the intro the American statesman who said that USA citizens must study foreign languages for national security was not mistaken one has to agree that our present conceptual way of coding and decoding tying and untying he, he goes back to that a lot knots we have these knots in us um social and systemic and systematic codes of alien cultures is the cause of insecurity and tensions in the world today a person by the negative labels one sticks on other people blinds and sinks himself okay uh so the big thing about it is he's saying that and at the same time he's introducing the reader to the language throughout the book He's given the translation. And what's interesting about these translations, um, besides the fact that they're hard, <laughs> because he's putting, um, you know, it's very uh, phonetic, right? So he's like putting these alphabet words together. And you know there's a way of saying it that is completely different from what you're seeing. So I tried to do translating, and I took my time through it um, to make sure that every time he wrote a word in the native tongue, I read it, you know? And begin to see how some repeat and how these uh you would want to call them sentences i guess but how the structure is formed um so he was saying how when they were when the when colonization came in they discredited 
these cultures without ever understanding them. Um, it gets so good. It gets so good. That's why I want to take my time. If you in for it, sit back, drive, whatever you're doing. Okay, on my book, uh, let's see, based on my book, Nwakango Yi Niza Yakun Zun Gidila La Mukango E La Mund Ki Lontore. Um, so a lot of that was French at the end. Anyway, a summary understanding of these concepts gradually, graphically, is of great help in order to comprehend the main ideas to be discussed in this work. For an African Muntu, the dead are not dead. They are beings living just beyond the wall, waiting for their probable return to the community. Ku Naseki, to the physical world. So, uh, this is chapter one, Congo, Cosmology, and Graphics. So he's walking through a lot of the ideas, and he's given a whole lot of translations. Whole lot of words, whole lot of words. Um, I don't have a lot of underlines here. This was a difficult part. <laughs> um, mapping the universe is a section in there, and that was cool. Um, and yeah, he's given a lot of words. Uh, and what's funny is Kanda. Kanda, Kanda, Kanda. Thinking Wakanda, right? So many words are made with Kanda. And Kanda means community. Um, and I thought that was incredible. It didn't hit me until almost the end of the book. I was like, oh yeah, Wakanda. Wakanda forever. Um, so it has some, some Congolese history there. Man, I really didn't do a lot in this whole first chapter. <laughs> uh, because it was just an introduction to the language to me. It, it was just, I'm understanding their words, their, uh, uh, he breaks down um, the universe. And so they use this cosmogram. And I have this on here. This comes back on over and over. And what's his name? Professor Ace, uh, African Creation Energy. He uses the cosmogram a lot too when it comes to um, engineering and the sciences. Uh, of course, we see it in like uh, electronics and, and electricity, modeling out the different concepts of current, resistance, inductance, voltage, power, that sort of thing. And then also with like fluid dynamics. And so here, he's using it in the context of uh, humanity, um, this um, Naseki, my Pimba, all these, it starts at the bottom, uh, the yellow to the black, to the red, to the white. So we'll, I'll leave it up because that'll help cement this stuff as we go. But um, these circles and these splitting in the fours, um, it's a part of the, the way they thought, but it's definitely not just like geometry at the base like it's all symbols no it's it's practice he is breaking down a way of life that is counter to so many things we grew up in a lot of times i know what's wrong i see what's wrong but i don't understand how to uh conceptualize it or even come up with something that's better enter chapter two african concept of law and crime now again this is my two congo but he always speaks about how this is uh, like prevalent throughout uh, many traditional African societies, right? Uh, pre, Pre-colonization. Now, he brought this stuff out in 1960s. So you got to think civil rights almost over. All the stuff going on in America is almost over. Um, they're already fighting in like Algeria. Ghana just got their independence, right, from a from a colonial power so after all of that he's bringing in these ways of knowing from uh, from these ancient you know pre-colonial societies after all those things so he even has things to say about it. now he's not putting that in the context of time in that way but he is speaking about uh, about present day Africa so and this was written in like 2001 so 20 years old all right let's keep going chapter two these europeans wrote about the culture of the people of this area including the bantu congo without knowing even superficially in the african language man's most important instrument of cultural communication and of social learning patterns and behavior 
The African people's total ignorance of their own traditional concept of law and crime. Oh, so he's saying that's one of the most crucial African problems, which leads to anarchy within many African governments today, is their total ignorance of their own traditional concept of law and crime. So right there, he's saying they don't even know. They don't even know. Uh, and you think about um, in post-traumatic slave syndrome, when Dr. Joy talks about going down to South Africa and then the one one area she vid, um one village she visited, um, they knew of their native tongues and the way that the children acted, the way that the community operated was different than the one that was totally disconnected from their past and had these kind of unruly children and that sort of thing. And um, they were all westernized. So showing how the westernization of those societies became their problem giving more credence to you know these savages da, 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 when they you know when it was a byproduct of separating them from their own cultural roots okay african leaders with few exceptions are considered foolish men mempumbulu laki yi mempundumuni mianisi because they act outside of african traditional legal aspects of leadership these leaders could have been excellent governors during the colonial epoch to serve their masters sufficiently yep all right uh, oh man he mentions this cool thing called second bureauism where basically someone is now he's speaking about the corruption within these african governments that exist today or at least 20 years ago i don't know today um but i do hear from people that i work with who are like from nigeria who talk about corrupt all their corrupt um like politicians and government and stuff and so i still hear about it and even gabon uh how cops are bribing people um or accepting bribes so that they want to arrest people like if you give me some money i want to arrest you for this whatever all right so the second bureauism is a secret polygamy of elites and bourgeois in certain african countries basically they hire someone on but not so much officially for a um certain position that gets something done you know to help the society no no they're hired on to infiltrate uh in his words a lady very often officially hired by a governmental or an administrative authority not essentially to play a governmental role in public life but in the eyes of the hiring side to serve as a means by which the authority intends to accomplish certain of its secret plans and intentions against certain individuals it considers as its foes. So this is one of the first times that he's starting to talk about how these government institutions and these politicians are seeing an enemy within their ranks. Like, And it comes back to that idea, uh, but this being my second time through the book, <laughs> as I go through it, makes that clear. Um, yeah, you'll see. Okay, uh, let's see, what is he even here? He's given some sayings here. Uh, and considering the physical and mental health of a leader, the true leader for the people, the Congo people say, community chief leader does not get mental disease, except otherwise according to the three variants of the precipitated principle on the health of a leader. A societal leader becomes foolish. It keeps coming back to becomes foolish. He becomes foolish if he bypasses his people's advice, becomes foolish if he usurps his people's prerogatives uh, becomes mentally sick if he intends to destroy the public's fundamental institutions such as Yimba okay now and it, it's just it's a clear clear vision of that society he makes it so clear it's not because again he was in there for like 25 years so raised in the thing um, he has some great anecdotes too okay many African leaders as well as intellectuals continue to underestimate their own people by the single fact that those populations do not speak Western languages, the languages of science, as they say. For them, says the imperialistic anthropology of some 15 years ago, those populations still have archaic mentalities. This is a grave accusation. So why do African leaders do the things they do? He's saying because they've been taught that everything before that was, you know, um, primitive, savage, archaic, um, and the Western language is the language of science, right? Now, this is just showing how civilization existed and was flourishing 
before colonization, before imperialism, and we don't grow up learning this, <laughs> but the facts are there and they're coming out. I mean, they've been out, but I'm just learning them. My God. I grew up in a village of at least a thousand inhabitants bef before it knew the rural exodus. There was not a single policeman. The jail was unknown. No secret agent. No secret agent, i.e. a people's watchdog. Now, I've heard this, but here's coming from a guy who was there. Um, there was no police. There was no jail. Those concepts did not exist. So to imagine that. So when I'm reading this, I'm like, okay, I've heard that before, but how does that work, right? How does that work? <laughs> he goes into it. Um, and, and before this, he's still breaking down a lot of the language, a lot of the language. And, you know, so many things are lost in translation. Um, I mean, going back to that Taoist thing and like Temple of Man, how, um, you know, speaking about, do you know the language, though, how they were, how they operated day to day? That's an important part. Uh, uh, still, the fact of Temple in Man, how he esteemed uh, the civilization. I absolutely admire that. Okay. Everybody felt responsible to everybody else in the community and its neighborhood. When a community member suffered, it was the community as a whole that suffered. Until age 25, it was very nice to live in that community, literally a community without problems. Such communities still exist in many parts of the world, which are known as, quote, developing regions, where the imperialistic arms race did not yet trouble the peace. So we are fed this uh narrative we literally are fed it i was fed this narrative of these savages of these savages these people that had to be killed but <laughs> coming from and that's the story of the people who were doing the conquering absolutely right but coming from uh someone who is in the community it seems almost it's so difficult to accept that story having been raised in this society it's so difficult but do you dismiss a man's life and say that he doesn't know what he's talking about. No, when you build relationships with people, and that's the great thing about reading books, because you're getting into the motives of the person. There's no way you can read a book uh, by a person and not understand more about their perspective on things, where they're coming from. Do they have an enemy in mind? Are they speaking against somebody? Do they have some kind of ill intent? You can read into that. Absolutely. Um, more so than you can in a movie, I would say, a lot of times. Uh, so anyway... He's just talking about his experience, right? Okay. Could you imagine or tell how many corruptions, fights, insults, falsifications, discriminations, kidnappings, and crimes are made every single day by our leaders and intellectuals in such cities? Any of those cities are as alike as any city in the world. And my question remains, where is that Kimuntu, the state of being human, that we should be? Okay, so this is him saying like, so he's coming out of that and he sees these things around the world and it's like where's the humanity that he grew up with now again he's going back to his he's going to break it down now our world needs a new order so this is his only time saying this sort of like this is the change we need okay africa may greatly contribute in building such an order if he chooses a law that sees a man's value and needs rather than his destruction um African people should unite and strongly stand on their own feet at this time where even the most democratic countries become undemocratic. That was a simple fact. I mean, to talk about being a democratic country and we're fighting for democracy all the time seems like counterintuitive. How can a society built on something have to fight so hard for it unless the system itself is broken? <laughs> right? Um, because that's what, hey, it's going to become a little more clear. Okay. A time where human rights observers, observers become human slaughter encouragers. I hope this study and its perspective of traditional African law and crime will be of interest to lawmakers and improve their understanding of these African concepts, especially those related to land and to social structure. The study is a description of traditional African legal concepts among the Congo, one of the most important zones of the African culture. Because of its alliance with Western imperialist capitalistic uh, capitalist masters, 
The present African leadership is developing legal systems on Western grounds which lack a clear understanding of African cultural traditions in terms of law. Traditions that should give rise to authentic and original African constitutions. Now, remember too, like Kenya, right? So when I was reading the Pan-African Revolt, uh, the Pan-African Revolt's CLR James, how you see when it's a uh, majority of African peoples, of indigenous peoples in these lands, and a minority of that imperialist um, sort of a capitalist regime that the majority will push them out eventually if they're standing on something. But even there, there are still traces of the Western ways of thought and that, um, I mean, continuous ties because to, it, okay, I'm not going to speak on what I don't know. So let me keep going. <laughs> I would like to discuss not as a specialist in the matter, but as an African who has been nourished by the daily life experience of this systemic of this systematic African way of living for more than 40 years in my African Congo community, not in cities, but in the countryside where the real African life is met and where most critical African problems are lived. And above all, where languages and cosmologies that generate all African thought and philosophy are still alive. Um, this exploitation has reached the highest point of national ruin. No one cares about real social and community needs. No one cares about what will be the national next day. No one cares about our positive old ways of thinking and of taking care of our fellow human beings. No one cares about our norms and values. No one cares, dot, 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 and so on and so forth, except planning who may be able to shoot at Kili Kili Dianesi, my opponent, digging for causes and reasons to eliminate anyone attacking insane political behaviors. So it's showing the, it just shows the switch in priorities like where the where the priorities should be why are people having to fight for their humanity in our culture less humanity is not valued you know i mean obviously um we all i have had growing up that internal debate about you know doing this one thing that will be you know noble and humanistic and charitable and then having to bounce that off the other extreme of like, but I got to make this money, got to make this money because that's what society demands, period. You know, there's no, everybody's living in it. It belongs first. Okay. No America needs to change because no Africa needs to change because it's populations need it and not because someone else wants it for them. It belongs first to every African leader to have the deepest understanding of all of our regional cultures that symbolize ourselves if we hope for a true real and profound change in africa the first continent of mankind and i love these books again because uh it's just opening my understanding and making me as humble as can be man and realizing the fall of my own ways like even 10 videos ago i feel like i've already changed i mean 10 books ago it's just crazy ethnicity is, is not a disease it is in its diversity a national pride nations are forests this is great right here Ooh, it's good nations are forests nisi mifenda says a congo proverb a forest of one type of trees is not a forest it is a endema orchard no matter how large it is for a forest is always an ensemble in diversity he goes on i'm on highlighting parts of course um and that whole idea of the Congo proverb, he has a whole list of proverbs. It's like, if you want to live by something, man, learn them bad boys. And one other thing about them before I get to them, because that's much later, is um, that the proverbs themselves would be like six or seven words. <laughs> and then the translation is like three sentences. So that's always funny because so much is entailed in these words and the way they're put together. Again, so much is lost in translation, but the um, the actions behind these words, the way they operate uh, is the thing that makes the whole thing alive. Like, can you imagine if that same drive to like try to conquer the world was instead to mix with every culture and how much would have been saved rather than seeing them as enemies. I mean, I just, 
it's it's a lot more to understand. But you get into the spiritual when you start thinking about that stuff. Okay. Um, ancient kingdom of the Congo that was destroyed by the Portuguese and its allies in 1482. Okay, so that was just me underlining the timetable. Leopold II gave up the Congo at the consent of the Belgian people in 1908. And I believe I covered that Congolese uh, rebellion and, and a lot of that stuff in the Pan-African revolts. Um, that was talked about with uh, CLR James. So it all starts coming together a little bit, starts to see the areas in Africa a little clearer. So you can um, speak a little more informed on this stuff. Okay. Boko, the most popular and most important school, was destroyed. Now we're hearing about institutions now, schools. And I was just listening to, uh, uh, man, what's her name? Anyway, speaking about the history of schooling in America and how you're looking at around 1880 when the first public school in like Georgia was like proposed and it was like black people doing that and then then came legislation that forced the schools in the um uh that went into making public schools and then came the segregation and they closed down the school in georgia and another one didn't come up until the 1940s black school so because of funding, because of discrimination, because of laws against them, against them reading. Up until that point, it was laws against them even reading, right? And so when you think about our history and education of moving in memory, of understanding our culture, it didn't even start until late 19th century. Like hundreds of years in of being separated from all your cultures. And then you're, you're starting to get a taste of remembrance. Everything else has to be oral. If you even had your family because you were separated from them over, over and over and over again. So maybe you're lucky enough to be a family third generation on one plantation as a slave to have some tradition coming down through slavery. But that's the only tradition that you're growing up with. And if you weren't so lucky, like the majority, you had to find your family post emancipation hopefully maybe meet up in canada maybe you could try to string together some ties you know hence the family reunions the homecomings and all of that right it's just and that's just our history <laughs> okay boko the most popular and most important school was destroyed social and political institutions were prohibited conga the structural base of the african community life as well as its organizational patterns were disorganized okay uh, those who were people became apes, says a popular folk song, which shows how colonial tortures transformed African people. We were people, but by exploitation, we are made apes, working in corvée. Twabidi, Kweto Bantu, Twaikida, Kidi, Mankiwa, Salanga, O Kiniimo. The word Salango. Oh, no, I didn't highlight that. I won't go into that. Okay. African authorities, because of their lack of collaboration with their well-informed countrymen and scholars, tend to reverse the national historical truth. So he's speaking of how it goes, man. He has great songs in here. Those would be great to put uh, to music. Okay. Opposition against colonialism and exploitation led the country to fight for and win its freedom in 1960. All right. Social organization. So now we're in the historical background of the Congo cultural zone. Um, each local community or vata, which is relatively independent, has two or more below. Oh, yeah. By the way, when I'm doing this stuff, I always recommend, um, you know, playing it back at like 1.25 or something. So uh, because I probably speak a little slower than you can um uh, digest it you know I always speed things up so I recommend it the Buta is the smallest but most important institution in Congo's social and organizational structure it is here that basic family education is carried out language parenthood relationships a general knowledge concerning local plants as an introduction to popular medicine community or ethnic history law migration ancestors etc now he's breaking down how society worked, where the institutions were. So again, to be taught that there was nothing, that they came and civilized, no, they literally destroyed their institutions. This goes back to Egypt, right? This is, ah, it's crazy. It's so important to have your own institutions. 
Okay. The bellow is symbolized by its public house where social, political, economic, and organizational issues are discussed before being discussed by the community assembly. This public house is called Boko, Mbongi, Yimba, Yusanga, Kyoto, a word that literally means house without rooms, i.e. a house in which privacy has no room. This is when it gets good. Now, you're talking about community, man, what community looks like. We didn't grow up in this is what I'm saying. If you in America and you're hearing this, you didn't grow up in this, man. I mean, maybe some indigenous Native Americans did, and I have yet to meet them because my education is so limited, but I haven't heard of this kind of society. <laughs> so this is, it's about to get good. Okay, this is, uh, what is this list? I give here certain proverbs related to that basically very important Congo social institution, the Boko. Now, I'm not going to read all of them, of course. I went to number 10. Now, he gives the native tongue and then he gives a translation, right? No samu katoma ku kyoto, kabia ku kyoto. All solutions are possible at ku boko. Conflicts are not discussed outside of the community institutions. And number 11, too. Kyoto, Kyoto, Kia, Kanda, Kalamanga. It is the boko that cooks community inhalation. The community healing meal is made at the boko. The boko is the healer of community diseases, problems of all orders. Man, it gets better. I mean, we ain't even talked about the crime and stuff, right? I mean, just wait. Okay, to speak about private affairs in this public institution, Yimba, is a public crime. Now, what are you saying? To speak about private affairs in this public institution. Now, at first I was like, so if you got problems going on with your wife, then you don't bring that up. No, 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 no. That's not, I mean, it becomes clear as you read. Granted, that still might be an issue, but that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the idea of things being private in a public institution. So similar to me, it reminds me of gossip. So, you know, when you're in a group at a job and you want to stand clear of this gossip going on, like people trying to say, hey, well, you know about da, 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 but da, 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 da. Now you're talking gossip about somebody else's affairs and you're bringing it into this public forum. Um, and that is the crime. So to me, that's what I took from it. That's, you know, got a right to interpret. Um, but that's what I took it as like, no, 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 we don't do that. It's all open and clear here. Uh, okay. Another very interesting Congo proverb principle says, what you think belongs to you, but what you say belongs to the public. Can you imagine? So again, is that kind of, I can say this to you, but I'm not going to say this out in public, right? No, 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 no. What you say belongs to everyone. So there is no privacy in regards to what you say that way when it comes to the community. But what you think, yeah, that belongs to you. I just love that. Inside, you are you. Outside you are not. You are only a tiny part of a huge and coherent body, the community within the universal totality. And I'm telling you, he's breaking down community for pages upon pages. I'm not going to teach it all to you. I'm not going to, you know, say his words, but I'm telling you, this book right here, this book right here, nigga? <laughs> In the Congo, there was no real standing army. Listen to that. There was no real standing army. Soldiers were recruited by general mobilization. The army in the old Congo was by and for all people. The main mission of such a populous army was to kick all enemies out of the ancestral taboo lands. The defense of the land was and still is the cornerstone of oral and written and unwritten legislation. And again, this just it just. And I don't understand why it's so hard for people to understand that it's not right to take over people by arms. Like you are literally forcing your will on people and they are your equals. But the only way you can do that and feel OK with it is if they you don't see them as your equal. And that uh, I was at. No, I don't know if I want to tell you. I'll go ahead and tell you. I was at work today and a guy told me about a. A book he's reading because I'm reading books when we're not working hard. Um, he got a book that he's gonna read later, and it's about a guy who worked like special ops. It's like a military guy, and 
they finish this one they have to go in to whatever land and they're like killing these people and they have to take out their teeth and get fingerprints and all this stuff to identify the people they're killing he tells me that and then he says so they have this last mission but they're out of kits to do it so the guys they just cut off the heads cut off their hands put them in the bag and they get back to base and their um their chain of command isn't there so they just put the bag on the table you know and they leave you know and then they have to call them back when the chain of command gets back and they get chewed out and that's like the end of his story it's like funny that they got chewed out for leaving a bag the death was not even a part of the story that was just a a detail a minor detail in the story the story was how they just had to do what they had to do and get out of there and they didn't care we're just gonna leave a bag bro you didn't give us our supply you didn't give us the tools necessary to do what you required so psh, you do it ha 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 you know and i just and so my response was like yeah death is our mission um we are accomplices to it right now it's sad and he couldn't, you know, he's like, you yeah, right. you know, just la, 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 la. <laughs> it was just, man. Okay. Anyway. Um, the ancestral land. This is a good one. Land was inalienable in the traditional system. Each domain was owned by a certain matrilineage, which could indeed grant the use of a part of its area to a relative or even foreign matrilineage. But this did not mean that it gave up its land rights. Okay. In their Fukiwa Insi, the unwritten law, the traditional land system, the Congo say to sell community land is to carry a mortal yoke. Whoever does not have access to land is dead, no matter how rich he she is. Okay. So he's just talking about land in general. And uh, he goes into it. Uh, I think, did I highlight it? I probably did. If I don't hear it in a little bit, I'll tell you. Uh, most scholars bought by capitalist, imperialist companies and corporations often reply that they do not trust unrecorded traditions. They totally ignore what their families, other fellow scholars have recorded about the African concept of land ownership. There are many documents by Western writers and reporters on African oral traditions related to the issue of land ownership. Um, okay. Okay. European colonial exploitation induced, yeah, here it is, introduced the theory of vacant land in Africa, ignoring totally um, the territory is the property of the community. Vacant territory does not exist. The African rotary system was instituted in order to avoid the impoverishment of the soil in a continent such as Africa. Without knowing, knowing the reason for what they saw and believed as a precarious abandonment of the land, they seized it because they had firearms and made it vacant. Now, that is the exact same thing that happened in America, right? Exactly the same thing. Let me go ahead and put it on the doctor right here. Let me go on, get his man his due. I don't even know if he's still alive, but uh, listening to him, I watched like one YouTube video with my man, Dr. KB, and um, I just felt like, I got to listen to him slow because it takes like 15 minutes to get used to his accent. And then it's easy going, but, you know, you got to uh, <laughs> gotta take your time. Just like listen to the old folks, man. You got to pick up what they're putting down. Okay. Um, the transfer of African community land to capitalistic and private ownership was the key to the destruction of the traditional African institutions of law and justice. The law becomes sterile. Oh, no, check this out. As Yabila says, <clears throat> this is a book. The law becomes sterile when one separates it from its melu. Its primary goal is to define existing and future adventurous properties and interests in African land. The people's land, which is a taboo ancestral land. Talking about this land. I put a star next to this one. The law must speak the same language spoken by the people and be written in that language. Okay, we're about to get into crime in a second. In many African countries, documents, newspapers, and books related to governmental activities often are not allowed to be sold in the country. They are kept in secrecy from the citizens. Boy, but 
exploitative companies and corporations have all the rights to access them. This fact shows and proves that most African governments work as agencies of foreign governments. And I put next to this taxes. And because it's just like with um, with getting your taxes done or we're getting legal advice, like there are so many systems in place to prevent you from getting the knowledge necessary to help yourself that these documents, this knowledge, although it's free because you can easily look up IRS code or U.S. statutes and that sort of thing, but to have someone as an expert for you in that, they have to already be married to the system. And then they can't do it for free to help you. Like it's, it's just, it just shows, it just shows how hard you have to work, even if you're in the system, to help someone. You have to make it your business to go out and help these people who need your help because the job itself is not, to, it's just not set up that way. I mean, that's what I see. So I'm just saying. And that's what it made me think of, like, not allowed to be sold in the country. Like, so many things you're not allowed to do um, in this country that um, it's just, it works against the humanity part. Okay. This capitalism results in crimes against innocent and peaceful people by preventing them access to their ancestral taboo land and the joy of liberty, the liberty of political participation. And I know this is kind of like ranting, and I'm sorry for that. Um, but when you learn about new things, you know, of course, uh, it doesn't change the reality you're in, but it definitely changes how you perceive it. And um, it definitely empowers you to uh, pursue change in a different way than maybe you did before you knew about alternatives, about what's going on outside your walls. Okay. Understanding les jeux de mots, word games, is very important in any study of two or more distinct cultures. Naganga, the initiated African man in the African way of thinking who is a specialist of perceiving the world's things, will himself prefer to say that the human being is a system of systems. He is also variably called Ngingu a Ngingu, a principle of principles. Oh, there's a little typo. Um, he is able as such to produce materially and technologically other mechanical systems. So it's uh, so now he's getting into um, uh, just how you're viewing man, how Western school defies man, and how um, African ways of thinking define man. And that goes into the cosmogram that I'm going to bring up again. But um, it's such a deep part as to how they interact with each other. Because when you grow up inside like this, where we're a means to an end, to we're a workforce, you know, how we're a number, you know, we're employers, you know, it, it's. Yeah. But to be built on that community where everything goes back to your identity with with you and with your mom and with your ancestors, like that's how it that's how it starts. That's how you're brought in to think about everything and every institution. Oh, just wait till you hear about the crime. Okay, okay. It's coming. It's all about this crime part. For the Bantu, there is no death and no resurrection. For them, life is a continual process of change. Animals are horizontal beings. They move and act instinctively. The Muntu, human being, is a VH being. Uh Kadi Kiatelama Dwalim Banganga Va Lukangola. He stands vertically on his feet first. He thinks in reasons before moving horizontally to meet the challenges of life and of the world. So he goes back to that vertical being and horizontal animals. Knowledge IQ is not in us. Knowledge is outside of us. The only thing we have in us is the power to shelve the information and data in us and reproduce it at will. It is wrong for one system to try to manipulate or impose one's way of thinking upon other systems. Okay, check this one out. The individual, before committing any crime, carries a certain set of learned criminal, cr criminal concepts. All right, let me just pause. Check this out. Okay, let me start over. The individual before committing any crime carries a certain set of learned criminal, 
Learn criminal concepts, images, expressions, symbols, discussions, words, habits, and facts upon diverse social scenes. In other words, for the Bantu, a crime is the result of an internal psychological state carried by an individual since his childhood, mainly accumulated during the period of growth when the child acquired social patterns. That state is given to him by his social, cultural, physical, and systematic environment within which he is bathed by negative as well as positive waves and radiations. And he goes back to those menika, meniani. Crimes are not individual acts. Okay. Crimes are found within social and cultural patterns in the food and in the way a society eats that food, in its taboos, in its language, and the vocabulary used to communicate concepts, ideas, and values. That's so powerful. My son was reading to me today. Now, he can't even read. He's four, but he's like flipping through the pages and he's looking at the words and he's making up a story based on the pictures. And he said uh, at one point, and so he kills the bad guy and he builds up a forest field and something, something, the end because he was dehydrated. And I thought about it's very similar to, you know, being raised in Cowboys and Indians. For me, being raised in Power Rangers, you're learning about destroying other people or things, creatures that look like humans um, since since childhood. Since childhood, you grow up with that. Um, yeah, so that was after I read this. But again, it gets better, man. It gets better. All right, so you're identifying what crime is, right? Now, this doesn't speak to how the community operates, how the community deals with that crime. Now, he says he's in a community where it's like almost like utopia, right? Like he almost gives that kind of vibe. Well, check him out, man. All right. Societies as well as systems prepare their own foes and their own underminers. Crimes are foes and underminers of societies and systems. Did you get that? Crimes are foes and underminers of societies and systems. The repetition of a criminal act shows how bad a system is. Crime for the Bantu Congo is a learned behavior and it is possible to eradicate it from human society. That is why I had to take my time with this book. That's the kind of stuff you just want to sit and pray over. Mm. In other words, a social system either favors or does not favor crime. In pouring warlike toys in our communities, children are engaged in the easiest process of learning how to commit crimes. In other words, the warlike toys industry has industrialized crimes within human society. Whew, let's keep going, man. This is Jesus. When a crime is committed, judgment should not only be passed on to the criminal, but also on to the entire community in which the crime found its roots. Now, he says that as if uh, like when I first read it, I'm like, yeah, but then <laughs> he has experience with the alternative. Wait till you hear the uh, mm, am I making am I building up right here? Jesus, be aware that that community gives poison by all means. Um, Kanda Diadio Nadikila Bavananga. Oh, I got to go ahead and read this. Um, a community in which a man or a woman poisons his or her spouse would have trouble finding new alliances with other communities. And one will say, and one will say to such community, be aware of that community gives poison by all means. 
As a consequence, no one will shake hands anymore with somebody from that community. No one will politically deal with such community. No one will seek water in such community. Nobody will dream to marry in such community, no matter how beautiful the youngsters are in that community. And nobody will seek a good friend in that community. Such a social behavior among the Congo tells how the crime is not seen as an individual act, but as a social one. If the poison used was developed within the community for other reasons other than killing the community, its holders of the community, Simbi, Bia, Kim, VUCA will develop a strong social and legal ethic about the use of that poison. In a society in which people believe in the concept of bearing crimes before possibly committing them, punishment is first considered communal before being an individual matter. And as a consequence, the elders' discipline on the young is very important. Okay, it goes into a section about crimes against land. This is one of the biggest crimes in the Congo, in the Bantus, right? Um, this kind of property inherited by the community, according to the basic concept and taboo of the inalienability of the land, is called Fuadia Kanda. The Fuadia Kanga is an accumulated heritage that enforces community control of land and all properties related to it. Congo does not permit rich people to lead national or community institutions because a proverb says a rich man never talks or fights for other people's interests unless it is to further his own interests. That is why traditionally wealth does not play a role in either the social ranking system or alliance making among the Bantu. This situation is changing today because the same rich individuals have the power to buy guns, which give them not only more power, but the license to kill whoever they declare is dangerous. Firing squads are increasing throughout the African continent, not of criminals, but of innocent individuals who are challenging corrupt practices of politicians. Come on. Yeah. Um, so this next section is uh, to represent his Kimvuka. So what is Kimvuka again? That was a... Uh, uh, crikey. Anyway, to risk misrepresent his Kimvuka is a political crime. Okay. Oh, to misrepresent the people or the community insists um, is to compromise the future of the community. The criminal was buried alive publicly in the marketplace. His diplomatic mission was one of the most dangerous functions. Failure in such a mission led straight to a cruel and inevitable death. It's all about how you represent. How you represent. If you don't represent the community right, that's that's the that's the biggest thing. How you represent the community. And he's talking about diplomatic functions like uh, when you will leave the community. Uh, it's, it's coming up. See, um, Congo proverb shows us that only obedience to the people's will makes people heroes and guides and not otherwise for the red carpet. And not otherwise, for the red carpet is not re requested, it is earned. Bantu's daily expressions tends to eliminate the subjective and egoistic use of I when dealing with important social issues. They prefer to build their thought on ancestral basis, historic and taboo basis, the accumulated knowledge and experience. The ancestors in their experience have said, or the past says, according to the ancestors law, the spiritual holders of the country have said, so those are all examples. Um, um, I'm looking for this one quote. Uh, okay. It's just so good. Let me not hold you too long. That's so good. Um, the debate process. Okay. So still going to this crime thing, right? Debate process. Uh, wealth does not play a role in the social ranking system or in alliance making. Human and communal values are more important than all the property a rich man may possess. The debate is carried on dialectically through diverse songs, slogans, proverbs, aphorisms. I love that word, aphorisms. Um, calls and responses followed by comments. The main goal of this procedural investigation is to understand social problems and conflicts through the accused and therefore try to find a remedy to cure him as well as the entire community so this debate process is when a criminal some criminal act they're brought before the brought before the public in a public course um in a public court right and 
when the discussion of the case is over now check it out let me pause again he's talking about it but he's showing you how they were how they were about it you know the diplomat who wasn't representing buried alive because he wasn't representing the people right he wasn't doing what he was supposed to do the leader that's the most important job it holds with it the biggest um punishment if you act out of sync with the people gone that and the land if you want a good steward of the land you want to do it right by the land and you want to do it right by the people killed public square death right okay now you got some other criminal act let's say uh you stole your man food or something or uh you uh you hit this dude on the street i don't know you broke somebody something stole their crops stomped out they i don't know you did something right okay so the debate process goes on when the debate is over two commissions mafundu are set up the first a commission of decision mfundu za zuzingo and the second a commission of social reintegration The first commission is established specially to take judicial measure fitting the case, e.g. death in case of extreme violation of communal law and taboo. This commission is only composed of men and women considered as outstanding dialecticians, judges, and whose names are chosen because of their interest in the total defense of the community and the inalienability of the ancestral land. Okay. The second commission or the reintegration reintegration ritual commission is more ethical than the judiciary one its mission is to find out means and a process by which social balance will be reestablished, and a process by um, and its law reinforced but also in the case of small infractions to establish a ritual process by which the guilty or the deviant will be reintegrated in the community life by the ritual of forgiveness or in the case of a criminal how he will be healed or punished each commission gives orally or in detail a complete report to the public it is up to the public to accept or to reject the commission's proposed decision in case of public rejection the case is left very often in the hands of the elders and the decision made by these men and women is rarely rejected it is said to be very frightening anytime the women's side favors a strong decision. Now, if them, you got them women upset, bruh. Okay. The Congo concept of law and crime as described here is not well known by the outside world, even by those who were their oppressors, the former colonial masters. This ignorance is due to two main factors. We already know why. But yeah, here's, here's his... Here's what he thinks are the reasons, which, you know, yeah. Um, the domination of the native majority by a minority of foreigners in the name of racial and cultural superiority. White, white supremacy, right? This notion of racial and cultural supremacy prevented the colonists from objectively seeing the cultural values of the colonizer. Again, the effects of white supremacy, you, the belief in this racial. Uh, okay. Okay. Their goal was and still is the exploitation of natural wealth or resources in order to further their own economic, their economy back home. And it's hard to, um, for them to see that, man. I don't know. It's, it's, it's crazy. But I'm not talking to them. They don't want to hear it. People who don't want to hear truth. To sum up, all aspects of the venture were subordinated to purely economic consideration. The educational system produce the skilled and semi-skilled workers needed for the exploitation of the Congo. Um, yeah. Only talking to those with ears to hear. That's to see. A morality based on order and authority. Okay. Capitalism. So, okay, now I'm going to fast forward because I'm already at 58 minutes, man. Let's just make it an hour. So, that was the real big push. I love that part. But then it gets into all of these proverbs and it's so many of them. And you see Kanda over and over again because that's like the community word. Um, but he has, I'll read one of them. What about number 44? It's like 50 something. 
na samu miyakanda miale mulungi variant <laughs> i want to say variant yeah in samu miyakanda kia mivuidi bulangiko mia nido ka nido community issues affairs do not have anniversaries they happen anytime anything at any time may happen within the community with regard to anniversaries they belong to seasons plants and to living beings any community member as well as any community leader oh any community member as well as any community leader must be aware about the kandwa kandwa kwa bulungi principle in in community affairs but all right and 50 um kisi kanda voka butu kilako mu mukwangi now that was a little short sentence right but then if not by birth one becomes a member of the community by a refuge adoption exile all means are available to integrate a society i thought of that because i'm like to create these kind of things in where we are today should be the should be the goal to make society more humane more just more equitable all those things right so to take from this this book to take from 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 their proverbs to take from their teachings um and be able to translate that into what we live in today should be the goal starting of course with your family you know so i think about ways to incorporate this into my small family unit and it starts with the land it starts to being settled in a place and that's hard for people so to get people to uh feel more empowered in in their communities in their little neighborhoods should be like priority numero uno but i'm not in a position right now to do that but that's where i want to be <laughs> you know stop moving around so much right settle in settle down somewhere start taking control of your of your area um uh, he talks about force de loi. Oh, check this out. All right, last one. A court without proverbs, translated here as judiciary, referential legal documents, belongs to the dead, says an unwritten Congo constitutional legal passage proverb. So basically, because he talks about like when they're doing the debate process, right, with the criminal, they're singing songs, they're doing chants, they're saying proverbs because they want to get to the point. They want to get in the mind and the spirit. And anyone who's been in church experiences this. A lot of times you can come to church and you won't identify with your own wrongdoings. But through the process of speaking about Christ and all these lessons in the Bible and all that stuff, you begin to surrender and you begin to take more responsibility for your own actions. And you give it up and you say, I was wrong. I was wrong when I did this. I was wrong when I did that. And so it's like you build up a spirit and an atmosphere to bring out these wrongs in each other to be, I mean, communal in that moment to be united to see the fault in all of us and then say how can we resolve this you know so to hear that you're bringing in proverbs into the court like it should be there else it is dead that's saying man this is powerful man come on come on uh he deals a lot with vibration in here um he deals with some anecdotes i mean the the whole talk about vibration these last little bits is incredible and he has some um some poems in the back, one about dreams and uh, about the physical world. And it's a great book. So good that I had to get another one. But this one humbled me down. So um, love it. Love this book. Where's my next one? Man, I ain't even got it over here. Yo, but my next book is uh, it's by um, a, uh, what is it, Arnold Schwarzenegger's daughter or something. This is another one from my therapist, man, because it's all about health. It's all about, you know diving deep getting understanding so the book is about forgiveness so that's the next one i don't know what to expect but coming from this bruh i oof from temple and man to african cosmology and now arnold schwarzenegger's daughter <laughs> hey keep reading all right